But uh, I was talking to Susan about this earlier, and Susan goes, yeah, wait, Cape Town still has something coming for us. So, <laughs> but uh, trust you guys will have a great time with us. My name is Lester, one of the pastors, and so I just want to welcome you this morning. If this is your first time with us, uh, welcome. I hope you have a great time. And in fact, because it's your first time, we have a special, well, let me turn it around that way. We have a special gift for you. It's a free book, so please come and meet us at the welcome table at the end of the service. Um, there are a couple of books to choose from, uh, but uh, we'd just love to meet you and to help connect with you and, and maybe even share a little bit of who we are as a church uh, so that you can just get to know us a little bit better. Um, the next part of this is our, as a church, uh, we believe in giving. Uh, a, a lot of the giving and the money that comes in goes towards the different ministries that we have here at Jubilee and around Cape Town. Uh, Jubilee members, this is part of how we worship God and it's what, what we do. And so a lot of this stuff happens via EFT. But if you do have cash, there is a box in the back that you can put it. If you're a visitor, uh, don't feel that this is like you have to give. Again, just what, how God leads you on that. Uh, but uh, yeah, be, be part of the worship service as we uh, enjoy Jesus together as a church. Now, there's a couple important announcements that I want to make that we just kind of highlight and, and hold on to. The first one is a whole church meeting that's happening uh, on the 16th of October in observatory. Uh, you know, the elders for a while now have been sharing and full of faith for this next season. And I think for those of us within the church, we, we kind of have felt a sense that God is doing something, God is moving forward and he's ca calling us to join him. And so we're having a special uh, church service, a uh, church prayer service uh, on that day where there's this gonna be some feedback. Basically, we've had two amazing gift day, kind of give you information on how that's happened, what's happened with that, what we're gonna be doing with that. Um, or, and, and this kind of sharing, but God is doing and for us as a church it's like what the cool thing about this day is that it coincides with new grounds prayer day uh, and so we're gonna be joining our brothers and sisters from all around the world um, as we pray and learn about what God's doing within us as a, as a church families uh, around the world church plants that are happening and we get to celebrate because uh, we get to see what God is doing uh, in our family so please join us on Wednesday the 16th. It's going to be at 7.30 p.m. in observatory. Uh, if you have some questions, please come to the welcome desk so they can just give you kind of information where that is going to be. Uh, but Jubilee, let's join together with our other, other brothers and sisters within the Jubilee family as well uh, just to hear what God is doing. So we really are looking forward uh, to that. You know, we get really blessed every Sunday with the worship team that leads us. Uh, throughout the Jubilee uh, churches, whether it's here in Cliff Street, whether it's OBS in the morning or, uh, or PM, uh, we are really are, you know, we, we really celebrate what God does and how people, he uses his people and their talents to worship. And I know you have been blessed with that. In fact, this morning was such a really special time again. And as I was looking up to the team, I just kind of went, wow, we are really blessed uh, to have people that serve us in this way. Uh, but the reality is uh, there are spaces opening up on the team, and we want to give people within the church that feel that they can serve and be part of that. If you are, you know, talented uh, singing or, you know, in, in terms of uh, playing an instrument, uh, we have auditions coming up. It's going to be taking place in OBS on the 20th of October between 11:30 and 2:30 p.m. Obviously, as you know, as us will you can have to go a bit later because we're finishing at about 12 uh, but it's fine you can still get there but please contact carissa uh, so that she can get your details and we can actually start that process uh, and this be part of an incredible thing of ministering uh, to god's people uh, in that way there's a lot happening guys next up exploring membership Again, we've got stuff happening. So if you are interested in joining us as Jubilee uh, and finding out more about us, our first session is going to be taking place on the 20th, uh, rather the 15th of October, Tuesday. Uh, please put your names down at the welcome table or use uh, Kaylin's address there, email her. Um, and so you'll be able to get more information about how it's going to work. Uh, you see there's multiple dates on there. Those are different. When it comes to exploring membership, there are kind of four actually major events that happen in the process. First, session one is kind of find out who we are. Uh, and then you'll be able to just kind of go, oh, this is what Jubilee believes. You can ask some questions. Session two is a more of a, inf a, like a lunch that we meet and we have a more of a deeper conversation. Uh, so we get to know you. We find out about life groups and how that works. Um, and then in between session two and session three, there would be an interview that will take place from one of the leaders from our core team that will actually meet with you so that we can, so you can ask the deeper questions. Sometimes it's hard to ask questions uh, in the group, but you can have a deeper conversation about I, I want, you say you believe this, what does that actually mean? Um, and then we have an interview. And then when, if you say, yes, actually I, I'm all in line with this and we're happy, 
uh, there will be a welcoming in, all right? So there's a couple of sessions in that, uh, but the first session is critical. You gotta get there so you get to know who we are. And so please contact Kaylin um, and be able to get your name on that list and you get more details. Uh, and lastly, this is the one that we're gonna celebrate. I want church, I really, this is a beautiful moment. Um, John and Larissa DeFries' baby girl was born. What a win. <laughs> what a win. The Bible says, I will turn your mourning into dancing. And we celebrate this family. Thank you, Jesus, for the joy of Abigail. Particularly for John and Larissa, Father. Thank you for that you carry them and you've given them this gift. You are truly a good, good father. Amen. Amen. Over to you, Lex. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be together and to uh, enjoy the sense of ex excitement as a, as a congregation. Um, turn with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 15, and um, oh, let me put this here. Yeah. We have spent really last year and this year enjoying and being thrilled by Paul's book to, Paul's letter in fact, to the church in Rome. It was a church that he hadn't visited before, unlike his other epistles uh, he's not writing back to a church that he started, which is the kind of normal, um, the normal process. Sometimes Paul is chased out of town. Sometimes he stays for a season in Ephesus or in Corinth and usually writes back. So the epistles, the mistake that's made is that the epistles, the letters that are in the second part of the New Testament can sometimes be wrenched out of context the context that they belong in, which is the book of Acts. So the Acts and the letters go together. And they mustn't be separated, because if you separate them, you don't really know what Paul's referring to over here, but if you have the book of Acts, you know, oh, that's what he's referring to there. So the two help explain each other. <coughs> so let's read together in Romans 15, <clears throat> and I do believe that this is a big word for us as a local church, that as we examine Paul's apostolic calling, it is not just something that's out there, but it's for us as a community. And I mean the whole of Jubilee as it currently exists. This is for us from God. So Father, I pray as we look at these verses together, I pray, Holy Spirit, you would put something deep and powerful in our hearts that will help shape our future together for your glory, amen. First, going back a little to verse 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing or as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. Yet, I have written to you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again, because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God. So he's not... Uh, a, a, an Old Testament priest offering sacrifices to appease God and forgive sins. He's like a, he's a new covenant priest, as it were. He's using the image of a priest. Uh, he's a new covenant apostle offering whole people groups to God uh, as a gift of worship. It's wonderful. Um, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, therefore I glory, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done in word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders through the power of the Holy Spirit. So from 
Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, that's right across the Mediterranean, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. Now, whether or not we'll get to that sentence, maybe we won't. He's not talking about evangelizing every single person. He means he has planted churches in the main population centers uh, from Jerusalem around to Illyricum. Others need to fill out the full work of evangelism and pastoral ministry in those areas. I, I say that because when I preached it in the other congregation now, I didn't get there. So there you go. I've got three points. Let's see if we can stick to them. Firstly, an apostolic community will be mature, will become mature. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. When you read these phrases, by the power of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't kind of mean, yeah, overflow with joy because you're a, as a Christian. As, these are very specifically chosen words. Every word of the Greek manuscript, the original autograph that Paul wrote was inspired by the Holy Spirit. These are very carefully chosen words. And when he talks about the power of the Holy Spirit, he actually means the power of the Holy Spirit. So we need to be careful that we don't kind of glide over phrases like this a key to having joy and hope in believing is being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and then he said, I'm convinced, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. So he's describing a local church community characterized by what he calls the power of the Holy Spirit, and as a result of that power and the gospel breaking into their lives, uh, we are to be marked by joy, peace. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, now, you, joy, you, peace, faith, you know. But these are the characteristics of a new covenant community marked by joy, peace. It's such a healthy, mature Christian. It's not heavy. It's not strict in that sense. It's not, it's... Marked by joy, peace, faith, hope. A local church is a, a gathering of people who are full of goodness and, and knowledge and is able, this is remarkable, to self-correct, competent to counsel, competent to instruct. Now, it's not a cold academic community, but it is one where learning and growing in knowledge is as important as a heart of goodness and kindness. Those things belong, are clustered together as they are in the character of Christ, in the uh, character of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so they should be in us as well. Those of us who've been believers even for a relatively short space of time, you ought to be by now competent to instruct others competent to explain the way of salvation to someone who is not yet born again, competent to help a believer who's thinking, but is that really wrong? Or what about, can't I do, how, why can't I do that? You should be by now competent to instruct one another. It's a beautiful picture of a local church. Who are these people? Oh, you know, the prophet went up on the hill. He looks down over the tents he says, oh, the tents of Jacob. She's beautiful. The church, the bride of Christ, a people filled with goodness and joy, ministering to one another in the Holy Spirit and growing and advancing in knowledge, in humility, learning from one another, able to teach one another. Isn't that wonderful? So here's the application question right at the outset. Where do you fit where are you serving in that picture? Where, where are you looking for opportunities to serve, to encourage, to share the knowledge that you're gaining? Are you looking to minister to others in their need? 
Are you spreading <laughs> goodness, joy, a word of encouragement here? And there. some of you really are, you are. But that's the kind of, that's Paul's apostolic impulse. It's the initiative. He's not like a passive, an, apost- an apostolic gift and an apostolic community. There's kind of, a, it's an initiative that comes up and creates things that weren't there before. It's very like God. This wasn't there, and now it's there. That's ministry. This, there was a gap, and now, you, like, let me give you an example. So I said to Joe just now, where's Vimpy, where's Vimpy? Oh, he's out with the teenagers. You know, he, no one, I don't, I don't know if anyone asked him to do this. I didn't ask him to do it. He's, he's like, he's not there on Sundays, and I, and I would, then I'd see him at the end of the meeting. Where, where are you? He said, I'm teaching in the teenagers. I'm loving it. He's started serving in, a t- in the teenage group, and he is absolutely loving it. No one asked him to do it, I don't think. And he, it's bringing him joy because he's giving. So what's happening here? He's now, with his experience, shaping young lives, discipling young men and women into the Christian life. Isn't that absolutely fantastic? Susan Winkworth and Steve and Diana Peterson decided, let's start a young adults group. And there must be others as well, obviously. But they said, let's start a young adults group. And it wasn't there. There was nothing. And now there's something. And it's called Yak. This is a hairy beast not, that doesn't roam among the plains of Africa, I don't think. Where do you find yak? We don't even know that, but it is a hairy animal, and they've cho- chosen that as their logo. That's how crazy it is. Something wasn't there that is now there. Diana, who took our, look, it wasn't bad, but took our kind of somewhat tired Christmas shoebox idea, and she has transformed it into a person-specific gift, support, blessing opportunity. That is amazing. That wasn't there. We just made, people made shoeboxes, some toys, and there's some sweets, and you know, someone would just get one randomly. What she's created is something where We know who it's going to. The gifts that are selected are specific for that person. And then that person receives a gift. That's a lot of work. That's a ton of work. Where does that come from? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) She's making Jesus great again. (laughs) You know, it's... This is... It, the initiative kind of comes up and where there was nothing, or in this case, you know, something that was okay. Joe and Jenny, about seven years ago, my Joe and Jenny Murphy, and they <coughs> said, let's just, let's start a women's Bible study. And it started fairly small. Every t- the amount of work, the man hours or woman hours in this, that goes into this. Every term, I think, since you started, there's been a six-week or sometimes a four-week, an eight-week Bible study for women. Initially, <coughs> just in this community, in this congregation, but now it's growing. The last one they did, there were 65 women meeting every week, studying the Bible together. Amen. <laughs> So that's like one of the biggest women's ministries we've ever done in our 40 plus year history as a church. Where did, it wasn't there, there was, there was nothing there. And now it's there. This current one, they've got 55, I think. And it's, now it's drawing in women from other congregations. And I'm sure it will begin to multiply as well. So this is, <laughs> this is what Paul is talking about. So I'm not saying we're not there at all. But he, <laughs> someone's going, mm, I'm not sure we're quite there. And we get to the signs of wonders in a minute. I myself am convinced, brothers, this is, you are, yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge and competent to instruct one another. I mean, let's not even think about the fact that the Clough 
Clough Street women largely run Sunshade, which is one of our biggest social ministries. And then you've got Jubilee Babies on a, on a Friday every other week. I mean, so no, it's not there, and then it's there. This is, I think, apostolic community, Christian community that's moving forward. There's motion. Secondly, and I'm looking at my time. I'm never going to get through it all. Anyway, secondly, apostolic ministry saves sinners, saves sinners and sanctifies saints. That's a terribly overuse of alliteration. But before we get to the evangelism and the pastoral aspect of the apostolic, we see there's a call to ministry. There is such a thing as a call to ministry. And salvation history is full of these moments of God calling certain ones into ministry. We don't hear about it today. It's all become a little bit professional and a bit business-like, and maybe there's some things we can learn there, but this is clearly biblical, a call to ministry, particularly in, for the apostles and the prophets, but I'm sure it's other giftings as well. Paul was called and appointed by God. He's not afraid of saying so. In the passage we just read, he says, I've written to you because of the grace that was given to me from God. Before he did anything, he, he has received something from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, a servant, a sent one. So there is such a thing as a call to ministry. That's how he starts the letter, the whole letter in Romans 1. Paul, verse 1, a servant of Christ Jesus called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And time and time again in the Old Testament, we see this again, one prophet after another. The word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord came to me. That's my conversion story. I don't know about your conversion story. My conversion story is the, word, the discovery of there, there, is a, there is a God. I knew there wasn't a God. And suddenly the God who I knew wasn't there spoke to me. This is revolutionary stuff. But even aside from the conversion moment, the word of the Lord can come to you. Do this. Go there. God speaks still. Jeremiah says, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I've appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Some of you have a prophetic groove on you. I don't know how, I'm glad this isn't being written down. I don't know how you'd spell groove. But there's, a, there's an unction there's a, an anointing. And some of you have a call from God. It's just beautiful. Isaiah, he says he has this vision of the throne of God. I mean, it's amazing. He's, in the, he's right there. This is, in terms of worship experiences, what we read in Isaiah chapter 6 is the pinnacle, Surely. I mean, the angels are covering their eyes and they're calling out, holy, holy, and God, is right there. And he realizes, oh, I'm a sinner. He's not evaluating the worship time. He's, he's, he's in the presence of God. And truly then, it is as that old hymn, lost in wonder, love, and praise. He's not thinking, you know, who's playing that lead guitar, you know, or whatever, like I sometimes do confession he's he's worshiping God and what I love about this moment is that God interrupts the greatest worship experience that a human being could ever have to talk about mission God interrupts the the most incredible vision of him and says, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And you could imagine, I think most modern Christians who love worship, which we all do, but, you know, would say, why are you interrupting? 
go, we've arrived. Why would I go? I've just arrived, this is it. It doesn't get better than this. I've, I've as- kind of ascended into the very throne room of God before me. The train of his robe is filling the temple, the glory, the smoke, the angels. God is there. My sins have been forgiven. I'm in the presence of God. Surely let me die now. God interrupts the whole thing. He kind of, that record scratching moment, and he says, who will go for us? Who can we send? Why? Because even our most, and we want them and we need them, our most exalted experiences of the presence of God in worship will still, from an apostolic perspective, will still produce this what about, like Paul at the end of Romans 8? Nothing can separate us from the love of God, neither height nor depth nor anything in, in heaven or earth or under the earth, and nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And the next thing is, oh, what about my people? I wish I could be even cut, if it were possible, cut away from this to reach my people. You think, what? It's the same thing. Do you never, in a time of worship, suddenly think, God, there are so many who don't know anything about this. They don't know who you are. They don't know the joy, the power, the passion, the forgiveness, the mercy. They don't know you, Lord. They've got this weird, deformed version of the God that they think we worship They don't know you, Lord. Have you never wept during a time of worship for those who don't worship? I have. God, who who can I send? It's kind of at the heartbeat of it. There's a call to going. There's a call to being sent. There's a call to apostolic ministry and a call to be an apostolic people. And then very quickly, two parts of that. It's an evangelistic calling as I've just pretty much explained that the Gentiles might be an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That's a description of evangelism. He feels, I'm, 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 I'm called to reach the Gentiles and to lead the Gentiles to obey God. That, it, it touches on pastoral work. We'll get there, but we mustn't miss this bit. It's not just a call to help Christians be better Christians. It's an evangelistic call. It really is. Christopher Ash, who is a former pastor, I don't think he's pastoring anymore, but he's a careful teacher, very much not an evangelist in his gift mix, writes this, how often a church or a Christian union, which is like a campus Christian ministry, how often a church or a Christian union says, we're not focusing much on outreach at the moment because we need time to build ourselves up first. And then he says the idea that the building up of the church and the reaching out from the church are separable activities, that they, they have to be separated. He says results from a misunderstanding of the gospel of grace. Absolutely right. So Paul makes a distinction between pastoral and apostolic in that sense or evangelistic ministry. So pastorally, he wants to reassert and remind them again But as a wise master builder, he's laying a foundation. Others will fill out the work pastorally and evangelistically. And he uses this imagery, as I say, he's not offering lambs to God, but whole people groups. Jesus said the the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. This kind of seems to be true in every generation. Ask God to send out laborers. But even actually, just think of the word labor. Labor is work. I should have done a word study on it. It's it's heavy lifting. What labor are you doing to help someone who doesn't yet believe in Jesus believe in Jesus? What work are you doing? Are we doing? But you individually, really, where is it in your life? Part of becoming an apostolic community means this becomes as instinctive to us 
as the examples I just gave of, and you could give more, of course, of people wanting to serve in the life of the church. Are you laboring? Now, we're going to do a short series after Romans and before Christmas. On We've talked about God, us, others. I know, I know this isn't an absolute statement, but the God worshiping and loving and the us helping one another and discipling is the relatively, are the relatively easier of the three. It's the others, by which I don't mean starting a social ministry. I mean evangelism, telling people about Jesus so that they understand what they need to do to become a Christian and doing it in a winsome way. That othering, that's difficult. It's not easy. And we've got so many caricatures in our mind of the socially inept, confident, and slightly embarrassing Christians who immediately come to mind when we think of evangelism. What the world needs is you, someone like you, rather than criticizing someone else for how they are doing evangelism. They need, the world needs someone just like you to be stirred in worship, to be stirred by the word of God, and to begin speaking to others. And then, secondly, this calling is a calling to teach as well. So the pastoral is there as well. In 15, he says, I'm writing by way of reminder. So he's not necessarily trying to draw, oh, I've got another, another chapter I need to write. He wasn't thinking in chapters. There were no chapters. But, you know, I, I need a little bit more here. <laughs> he's not, by way of reminder, is fine. Most of Paul's letters are that. They are, he's writing back to churches that he's just left, which you read about in the book of Acts, and he's reminding them of his lifestyle and what he taught. Most of it is. And so for us, how would we develop a community that's filled with knowledge and able, competent to instruct one another without consistent exposure to Bible teaching on a regular basis? And that's why we teach usually, mainly, from a book in the Bible. We're guided by the ideas that are inspired by the Holy Spirit and are there. As much as possible, it's, we don't go, these are fancy topics, sexy topics from the culture that we need to, that'll draw the crowds. Maybe it will, I don't know. But our approach largely is to try and understand Scripture and to focus on, we want to build bridges between what Scripture says and the culture around us in its diversity. But... We want to be consistently learning from the Bible. Your knowledge of the Bible is absolutely critical to your growth in grace. It's not only about character. It's about what you actually believe and where you got, got those beliefs from. Where would you get your beliefs from? It's really, really important. Uh, not only our awareness of sin, because sometimes life kicks back on bad behavior. Not always. That's why we need the Bible. But the discernment the ability to define, is that sin, but that isn't sin. You need the book for that. You need the Bible for that. If you've, if, imagine for a minute <coughs> that you've never ever met a gardener or seen any gardening tools. You've never seen how, what they look like, the shape they are, or how they would be used. If you've never seen gardening tools, you will not be able to call a spade a spade. You won't be able to. You won't know. You won't know. And if you've never been confronted by the clarity of the Bible on issues like sexuality, hospitality, generosity, holiness, you will not be shaped by its teaching. You won't be. You'll be shaped by other things. You'll believe other things without knowing what the Bible says on those things. Even when someone says, oh, well, some people, you know, they believe the Bible says this or they believe this or that. You won't even know. Actually, is that a fair representation of the things that I believe? Is that even in the Bible? You won't know. You'll just be reacting and responding and having doubts suddenly spring up on you like, ghosts in the middle of the night that scare you, you won't know what the Bible says. 
you won't actually know. And I, I mean, I can't believe this of anyone in this room, but you may say that you love Jesus and you're following him, but you may have the wrong Jesus. <laughs> How do you know? How do you actually know if you don't know your Bible? I mean, it's a straight question. So you need to regularly and systematically work your way through your Bible. You need to be someone who is reading the whole of the Bible regularly. Now, I know some people can't do it in a, in a year uh, because it is, it, it, you will have to commit yourself more than to whatever box set you're trying to finish. But, you know, you, you're going to have to make a commitment if you want to know the Bible. If you want to know what God thinks and what God says about something rather than just what your friends think and say or what you think and say, you, you, you need to be shaped. That's discipleship. Take my yoke upon me, upon you. It's like, well, I don't like yokes, so I'm not going to do that. Well, you're, you're already putting yourself outside of something. What does that even mean? What is that yoke like? Ooh, is it like that? Or is it like that? You don't know. You need to read the Bible. We need to read the Bible. I mean, you may have a Jesus that sounds very much like what people believe before they are stunned and changed by an actual encounter with him and with his word. Because when you've been stunned by his word and you've thought, oh, no, surely. <laughs> and then having to work through, what does that mean? What are you being shaped by? Well, you know, one teacher says this, another one says that, someone says this, someone says that. How can we know? Well, fortunately, we have a book. We have a book. God has given us his word. In fact, he's given us his very words. He's given us a book. There's a, there's a lovely passage in the Old Testament. I love it so much where um, there's a young king. Come, you know, you, if you've read your Old Testament, you know that after David and Solomon, there's a kind of, there's the, the king is split into two halves, and there's a succession of them. And this king did good in the Lord's sight. This king did evil. In the Lord. And this king did good in the Lord's sight. This, this did, ah, did evil. And this king, you know, and it's like a succession of good to bad. And it's kind of irritating in a way. So Josiah comes in, he's a young guy, and he wants to restore the temple, and he wants to get rid of the idols, and he doesn't do everything outside, but he, he at least restores the temple. So he commissions some guys, he says, right, go into the temple, it's fallen into disrepair, let's clean it all out, there are idols that have been worshipped in the temple, let's get them out, let's try and return to our God. So they go in, and they're cleaning it out, and one of them Hilkia, his name is, finds a scroll. He finds a scroll. And there's this wonderful passage. I don't know where it is exactly. Is it one or two chronicles probably? He goes back to, to the king, and he, the, king, the messenger says to the king, Hilkia the priest has found a book. Hilkia the priest has found a book. <gasps> what a discovery that is. Again, Throughout history, the discovery of the book, Bible says, doesn't it? The entrance of your word gives light. This is the story of the Reformation. They rediscovered the book. This is the story of your conversion. You rediscover or you discover for the first time the book. This is the story of your growth in grace. You rediscover the book, the word of God. We have God's very Words, hallelujah. And there was a restoration period, a, re a reformation period under Josiah because of the word of God, hallelujah. And all of the ministry gifts that Paul lists in Ephesians chapter four have a teaching drive at its center. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. They are teaching gifts as well they are very much doing gifts otherwise nothing would get done we'd just be very well taught but they are teaching teaching the bible is at the core of each of those four gifts hallelujah okay i'm going to move on to my final point which is which is this which is another thing that just speaks to you from this text 
and which we must not just glance or glide over, which is this, that all Christian ministry is dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit. We are dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit. I won't be long. I myself am now sweating. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. It's okay to glory in Jesus in your service, in the things that you're doing for God. You're not glorying in yourself, but you are glorying in him that he gave you such an opportunity, that you gave you such fruit, that he gave you such an open door, and that you went through it and he did stuff. It's wonderful. I glory in Christ Jesus. And then <coughs> he says, it sounds contradictory. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. That's the key. He's clear. Jesus is doing this. Jesus has done this. So I glory in Jesus, but he has done it through me. He, he, he's not like, I remember Terry Virgo once said <coughs> that um, they were in a worship time, Switzerland or somewhere in Europe, and the, the pianist was fantastic, playing beautifully. And afterwards, I don't know if he really, this is what he said anyway. Afterwards, he said to the pianist, the piano player, that was absolutely beautiful. Let's call it Jenny. You know. <laughs> and she said, oh, it wasn't me. It was the Lord. And he said, oh, it wasn't that good. <laughs> <laughs> now, I cannot imagine Terry actually saying that. And you wouldn't say that, would you, really? But it's this thing of, it, it is you. It is you. When you serve someone, when you share the gospel, when you reach out, it is you doing something, but Jesus works through you. And that, that harmony is powerful. That's very powerful. That's what you're looking for. So it's not like, unless I feel like I'm taking off here, I'm lifting off, God is working through me to such a degree that I cannot deny it, and therefore I do. The apostolic impulse is I'm going forward, I'm sent, I'm moving forward. I, we've been sent here to preach the gospel, to share the good news, to pray for the sick, whatever it is, to build something that's gonna bless people's lives. We're moving forward, and then Christ working through us by the power of his spirit. So I heard a wonderful report, Lester, of your preach to the kids club. They said, Jeremy said, it just went up a notch. So Lester's preaching to the kids in his storytelling style, and people are like, the kids are like, we love this. It's Christ working through us that so makes the difference, just makes it, otherwise it's just, just words, it's nothing. Okay, I need to end, I'm just trying to find how to. Um, carry on, no, that's not how to end. <laughs> um, so our emphasis on the Bible, oh, did I read the rest of the verse? I don't think I did. Christ working through me by, what I, by a word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I fully proclaim the gospel, which I've said is planting churches. And I'm not sure someone's apostolic just by wanting to be or by declaring it. Planting churches, communities are actually in, were there that weren't there before. Um, and I think there's this balance. We will keep the Bible absolutely non-negotiable. So when you come on the Exploring Membership course and you're looking to join the church, our vision, our values are shaped by the Bible. And you're totally allowed to say, is that one really a Bible thing? That's allowed. So we're going to continue teaching and loving and working from the Bible but we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul says the power of signs and wonders. He doesn't play these things off against each other, which is the immature response, in my view, that you're not biblically balanced if you're forever trying to downgrade the word of God or trying to downgrade the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a balance that is absolutely shot through the whole Bible, not even just the New Testament, the whole Bible. 
So the appropriate, the accurate biblical approach is God's word and God's spirit together in exactly the same way. And I think this is a Hebraicism which works from the old covenant into the new. Just as your, when your word comes out of your mouth, breath comes out. When I say breath, when I say the word, I can feel the breath coming as well. God's word and his God's spirit and his spirit are absolutely united and we mustn't separate them. We must keep them together. Otherwise, there's an imbalance. And we see it in Paul all the time when he writes in the epistles back to the churches that he planted. He's forever saying things like, when I came to you, I didn't come with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. That's to the Corinthian church. Or to the Thessalonians, our gospel didn't come to you in word only, but also with power and in the Holy Spirit. So a genuine biblical balance there is teaching from God's word and the, an experience of the Holy Spirit together. Now, how do we respond to that? Well, we want to grow in these things. We're not at zero. We've had some wonderful testimonies of, for example, healings, but we also know not everyone gets healed. So we don't throw out one of these. We don't lower the word of God. Well, when he says, ask and you shall receive, well, that's not true. No, we keep, we keep the word of God and we keep the expectation of the spirit of God as well. We keep both. I need to finish. Um, same for Jesus, same for us. Earnestly desire spiritual gifts. So, in conclusion, throughout the teaching, he's asserted our need for knowledge, our need for power. He wants us to be Paul, and I believe God's word to us through Paul's description of his ministry. He's done the, t the main teaching bit, hasn't he? He's now telling us about his ministry and then he's gonna send some greetings to the church in Rome in chapter 16. We're in a situation where I don't know if the population of South Africa has been evangelized or whether it's been partly evangelized, half evangelized, but We've got the challenge that they have in the US as well, where the majority of people will say, I am Christian. I'm a Christian. Now that's a challenge to us, but it's not something that we should back away from. It just means that you're not going into a situation where if you say, if you imply that this person that you're speaking to is not a Christian, that would be offended. In some situations, they wouldn't be offended at all. Of course I'm not. I'm a Hindu. I grew up in, you know, Calcutta, and that's where I live. I'm not a Christian. That wouldn't be an offensive thing at all. But in, in our kind of context, we have to be careful. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't move forward apostolically, either planting new congregations nor evangelizing. We shouldn't be quick to, oh, draw back again just because someone has a Sunday school version of Christianity. Now, this will become less and less as time goes on. It seems that way. So in the UK, Nicky Gumbel, who heads up the Alpha thing, he talks about re-evangelization. I'm not sure we're re-evangelizing. I think we're relaying foundations. We're starting again and sharing the gospel. So let me end. There is such a thing as a call to ministry. Maybe you've got that call. Maybe it's, you've not done anything with it, but maybe God's spoken to you. It may not be a, a full-time ministry to be set apart like Paul for the gospel. It may be worked out in some other way, but there's a call on your life. I would say do not let the dust settle on that call. Move towards it. It's a call to maturity. It's a call to reach the non-believer those who aren't walking with Jesus and don't know him, as well as a call to sanctify the saints. It's a call to the word and the spirit, and it's a call for us to reach beyond the region we're in now and to spread out beyond the jubilee as it exists now and to plant a few new jubilees. That's where we're going. There is an apostolic call upon us as a church. Amen?
Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your, your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us and for us. And we pray, Father, as we continue to follow you and love you, that you would give us ever-increasing encounters with the Holy Spirit, and you would draw us forward into the future you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> amen. Hallelujah. Lex, thanks very, very much for, for that.